Hello, everyone. Last presenter of the day, John Stoffaker, is going over some embedded device security testing. John, I'll, I'll let you take it over from here. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Um, I, I guess, Louis, do you want to allow me to uh, share my screen? This sort of field, or even know how to get into this field. It's very uh, scary to, to think about taking stuff apart and, and, and really breaking stuff um, is what we do a lot of times. So I, I developed this slide deck and this talk just kind of as an intro, get people comfortable with sort of the things you're going to be doing. Louie, did you get my slides? Hopefully. Yeah, I'm sharing uh, my screen here. It's can is can you see that? I cannot. Hmm. Once once again, Zoom is being uh, not, not the cool. funnest. <laughs> <laughs> we can go without slides. Um, I'm fully prepared to do that. Uh, can anyone else see the slides? They are saying that they can. Uh, okay. As long as we can, we can sync up. Uh, let's go to the second slide, and I'll start from there, and I will follow along with the beep. Got it. <laughs> All right. So, obviously, I've gone through my intro. Um, what else have I done? Uh, I've been a WRCCDD team member for over a decade now. Um, many, many of you have probably seen me around when we used to do it in person. Uh, it, it's been a fun event that uh, I make sure to mark on my calendar every year, uh, as well as a DEF CON goon. I've been doing that for a number of years as well, my, my yearly pilgrimage out to the desert to, you know, I, how do I put it? Um, Convince the humans that making lines is cool and, and waiting for things is the way to spend your time. Uh, I'm also a background Synac and HackerOne alumni. Uh, I've been worked through all three of those programs, been the top leaderboards there. And interestingly enough, that's one of the ways that you get in, introduced to this fun world of embedded device uh, uh, security research in that there's a lot of companies out there that are willing to pay you to break their devices. And um, that's what makes part of this kind of fun. As well, there's my Twitter. Uh, all right, Louis, if you want to hit the next one. All right. So as we're going down, uh, here's a little bit of agenda today because it's always good to start an agenda. The colors don't really mean anything. They were just on the template when I threw it together, so I thought they looked pretty, so I kept them there. But if we're going to start with some rules, uh, even though we are going into the space of security research, and you know, I talk a lot about breaking stuff, there, there are some simple rules of the road that we, we just have to follow. Um, you're going to be dealing with devices, big and small, and there is a non-zero chance that you might start a fire or um, any of those things. So it's good to have some ground rules. Uh, as you saw in Wasabi's talk, you know, when you, when you get up to stuff like ATM machines, a little bit of prevention goes a really far long way. And I'm going to get into, you know, kind of what, what are you going to need? What, what are you going to put in your toolbox? Amazingly, most of the stuff you're going to find you can buy on Amazon right now, fairly cheap. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of specialized tools and equipment. And the stuff that is specialized, I'll get to and, and let you know. But a lot of this stuff is stuff that's just going to be good to have, whether you, you go down this path to career choice or whether it's just a fun hobby. These are things that you'll probably will always want to have with you. And then how do you get started? You know, how do you, how do you find your first target? Where, where do you dive into this? And then obviously, you know, where, where to go after that. So, Louis, let's hit slide three. All right. All right, here's my educational requirement to uh, lay out some rules. One, be safe. Um, as I said before, there, there is a risk of fire or electrocution. Um, we, we are going to be diving into an area where some companies can put a lot of time and effort in making sure you can't get there. So let's, let's be safe. And what do I mean by that? Um, you know, as you'll see when, when I start talking about target selection, we, we don't want to operate on high voltage at this point in life. In fact, really, you don't ever want to be operating on high voltage. Uh, uh, and, and But the beauty of it is that most of your consumer devices all run off low voltage DC. You know, why it's 120 volts out of your wall and has to be down converted to, to 12 volts DC you know, by this big, ugly, you know, wall wart and just to power your electronics. Well, that was because of a fight between you know, Tesla and, and the world. But in all reality, what you're going to be working with in, in most cases is, is going to be low voltage DC. Uh, if you want to go really into the design and, and the security reach behind power rectifiers and, and smart meters on, on, on the supply side, spend a few years before you start doing it and, and re-up your life insurance because uh, it gets kind of hairy. 
uh, my, my second rule of the road is buy another one. <laughs> Uh, much like the rules of gun ownership, uh, the rules of embedded device security research tell you that if you really value it, if, if it's something that you can't live without or if it's somebody else's, you probably want to buy a second one because you're probably going to destroy the first one. Um, I had a chance to do some work uh, with a gentleman named Brian Knopf. Uh, he's on Twitter, DUQA, and at the time he was a product security lead at this IoT company. and. Um, they had sent me a box and you know, we had owned it in a couple of days and uh, I met him at a, at a party once and you know, I was explaining to him how it was kind of funny that his developers left some physical you know, ports of entry open. And so he's like, all right, I, I got that. He's like, I'll send you version two. And when, when I got it, the, the box was literally covered in epoxy. You opened it up and there was nothing but a, a black tarry blob on the inside. And, you know, obviously to, to get down to what I needed, required literally destroying the thing. So uh, my second rule of the road is always, if you love it, if it means something to you, if it has monetary or sentimental value, uh, buy a second one. Um, <laughs> because you, the, you have to go at this from the mindset of, of achieving your goals. And that may mean that you have to uh, make some irreparable damage. The, the core of this is be prepared to void the warranty. Um, it's going to happen, and then that's just the nature of the game. And so uh, mentally, you've got to get yourself, you know, in that mindset to when you break that seal, you are committed to what you're doing. Third one is always be responsible with testing, with disclosure, with with everything you're doing. Be responsible, be honest, be upfront. Um, when you find something, find the responsible way to drop it uh, to the company, whether it's through their P-cert organization or through a bug bounty like Hacker One or Bug Crowd. Be responsible in what you're doing, and you'll find that the companies will respond to you better. If you find, you know, an exploit in, in some IoT device and you just drop it on Twitter, uh, there is a reaction that happens within that company that costs a lot of time, money, a lot of phone calls. Uh, it's best if you handle it through the responsible ways. And, and there are companies out there that will help you guide through that whole process of what it means. And I just realized I left the static text up there. That's pretty cool. All right, uh, next slide, Louis. Okay. So, uh, yeah, um, it's dangerous to go alone, so uh, take this. Uh, my, my fun screen cap from Legend of Zelda. Uh, you're going to need a few things, and we have Amazon. We, we also have AliExpress. So the, the difference comes down to this. Uh, for a lot of these things, uh, Amazon can get it here quick. It's usually probably not the cheapest. Uh, you can go down the route of AliExpress, but you realize that while it may be cheaper, it's going to take you a long time to get here. So you have to weigh how much money is in your budget, how much time you have, and, and where you can source it. There are also some areas where uh, you can source it from your local Home Depot. Uh, sadly, children today, or even you guys, don't have access to Radio Shack. Um, that's where, uh, as a kid, I used to go find most of the stuff. and. You don't have it anymore, so you're forced to wait on the UPS man to deliver your toys. All right, Louie, let's go next. Got it. All right, so here's the fun slide, and you all probably want to screenshot it. Uh, this is what you should have in your toolbox, and then there's a good reason for all of this stuff. Uh, at a basics, you know, a nice soldering station doesn't have to be a, a Weller, you know, gas-powered one. I mean, you could do it with a, a cheap but robust one off Amazon, uh, they're littered with them. Uh, this is going to help you not so much with actually making things, but for breaking things. Uh, soldering stations are, are great for taking components off, for you know soldering on your, your own workarounds, your, your physical hardware exploits. Uh, when I got into this game, I got into it through modding my PS1. Uh, that's where I learned how to to solder, and it's where I learned how to get around anti-tamper and to do most of these things. And if I just, you know, dated myself, I'm sorry, but um, it, it it was one of those tools that they kind of opened up a lot of possibilities. Second one on there is Bus Pirate. Uh, if none of you are familiar with this, uh, a Bus Pirate is a simple device that you can find on Amazon. I think they're like twenty some bucks. That allows you to speak in different protocols to the different hardware that you're going to be interfacing with. There are a myriad of different protocols that embedded devices speak from normal TTL serial down to uh, JTAG and, and some of these other protocols, some you know, RS-44 for the industrial control systems. The bus pirate 
map, kind of maps it all into one device that can speak everything. And this is so important, so you're not having to go and relearn all all this stuff and, and kind of go go through that whole process of having to learn these individual protocols. You have one device that speaks everything. It's relatively cheap. Uh, they even have kits where you can put it together yourself if you really want to test out those uh, those skills. Going down there, uh, serial cables. I, I can't say enough. Uh, you, you will run out of them. Um, you will misplace them. You will leave them places. Uh, the, you know, the, the serial to USB converters, uh, they go bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, screwdrivers, I have this on here multiple times. I, I didn't mess up. Uh, understand that there are many different types of screwdrivers in the world uh, of all different types and quality. Uh, having a good Phillips and a straight blade is great, but you're going to find in the areas where you're going to need a star bit. You know, the, the security screws that for some reason you see on the uh, bathroom stalls that uh, I guess if they don't want you taking it apart while you're sitting there. But you'll find that those same screws get used in a lot of consumer electronics. Um, having the different bits and the different taps and dies to be able to work through whatever you're working with. Uh, there are times when in your process where you're going to come to a, a choice to be made. Do, do you take it apart uh, and, and order the right tool, or do you just get out your, your sawzall and, and go ham on it? Uh, either way gets you to what's inside. It's just a matter of you know, do you want to go to that route of destroying it. A good multimeter. Uh, this is important as you get into the exploration part of this game, right? When when you're looking at the, those hardware interfaces or when you're looking at how something works in order to best plan your attack, if you're trying to figure out whether that pad on the PCB is, a, is an SPI or if it's, you know, serial, does it have 5 volts coming out of it or does it have 12? Um, a multimeter is key and they're relatively cheap and can be found at, at Home Depot. Um, as long as you know, rubbing and drinking alcohol. Now, don't get these two confused. Uh, rubbing alcohol is great, not for sanitizing things, but actually for getting out hot glue. Uh, most people don't realize that uh, any of the silicone-based adhesives or, or hot glue or anything will easily peel right up with just you know a liberal application of rubbing alcohol. Uh, it also cleans up contacts on PCBs and. Uh, can really do wonders in getting around some of the very, very low-tech anti-tamper uh, evident in, in most commercial products. Uh, the drinking alcohol is, is for when you hit a, a problem that you can't figure out how to fix. Um, it, it helps with uh, you know, releasing the mind to, to greater powers. Uh, and then uh, lastly, you know, the dry chemical fire suppressant. So uh, this could be a, a box of, of uh, baking soda or you know, a, a non-flammable blanket or something to smother because you are dealing with electricity and it likes to jump out of things and it can catch fire and, you know, burn down your station if, if, if you're not careful. Again, this goes back to be safe, but also keep around your dry chemical fire suppressant. All right. Now, a bit beyond that, um, the, the second category here are, are nice to have. You don't need it now but you're going to get to a point in, in your journey where you will need it, uh, a bench power supply. i uh, go back to my original thought of, you know, don't tackle high voltage right now. Uh, if you, if we realize that most components are, are operating on very low voltage DC, but uh, you know, they, they came with a power supply and, and it's integrated into the device. How, how, like John, how do I work on that? If I'm not working with high voltage, well, that's where the bench power supply comes in. These are devices that you can supply five volts and whatever amperage you need straight to the board itself, bypassing that ugly power brick that they gave you and bypassing all the the, the, the danger that high voltage brings with it. So you, know, you can rip off that, that cord, just cut it and, and wire directly to your bench power supply. Uh, again, these things are, are plenty uh, in Amazon. They, they range in feature sets and what they give you. You know, we, we're not underwriter labs, so we don't need a reference power supply. We don't need it to make sure it's exactly 5 volts. You know, we have tolerance. You know, you don't need it exactly 12 volts. It, it, you know, buy what fits your budget, but it, allow, it again, opens a door for you to to experiment safer and, and better with, within the confines. Now, lucky for you guys, the college probably is, has plenty of these. In fact, they're, they're probably throwing away a whole bunch of them a day. Go go look through your WTs. Ask them. Ask around. Someone's got one that they've got to let go of that you can get for a song. Um, 
Same with the rest of these. I mean, uh, jumper wire and snips, obviously, if you're creating, you know, hardware min hardware workarounds or mitigations, um, or you're really getting really into this, and, and, you know, these are things to have. Decapping station, if you really want to get into some of these more advanced attacks where, where you're reading out the memory of a, of a flash ROM, right? Uh, you need some way of getting it off. You, you need some way to decap or, or take that chip off the board or even, you know, take the... Uh, epoxy off the top of the chip. Same with a reflow station. A reflow station is just a fancy way uh, of heating up the board and, and getting those components off in a safe manner that you can also reuse them, but you can analyze them later. Now that goes into the fringe stuff. This is stuff that you, you probably only need once or twice, or if you're like me, um, they're, they're kind of ghetto, but a, a toaster oven. So they're like, John, what does a toaster oven have to do with uh, you know embedded system security? Well, a toaster oven it, it, or a convection oven, and it's similar, um, are, are very cheap, and they get up to about 450 degrees Fahrenheit, and they'll generally melt about any adhesive anyone throws at you. They also are really good at releasing components from PCBs. Now, I'll warn you, um, you must do this in a very well-ventilated environment, as heating up electronic components does pr produce a uh, risk of inhaling carcinogens and all the bad stuff that goes into making them. So. Uh, you use it safely, but it is they're readily available. They're fairly cheap. You can get them at Goodwill for you know a couple bucks, and they will help you in those cases where you know you have a product where, where there, there's no way to get inside. I mean, you look at it. There's no screw holes. There's no points of entry. There, there's nothing that you can you know grab a hold of to pry off of. It's obviously been glued shut. So how do you loosen the glue? Well, you got to get that thing hot. Uh, so a toaster oven, convection oven is your best friend. I, I've got one sitting out on my bench that that I use for, uh, you know, <laughs> making sure I get the plastic to, to go the way I want it to. Uh, Flare camera is very similar. It, it, it's it's a camera that takes a picture of, of the infrared spectrum of a device. So when you're watching it run and operate, you can kind of tell what's going on inside of it. If you can't peer into the device and you don't have access to an x-ray machine, a floor camera is a good way to tell you where components are at. So if you have to make some destructive means of entry, you're not damaging any of the smart bits. Now that leads me to the next one, x-ray machine. You're like, John, I'm not Madame Curie. I, I can't just get a, an x-ray machine in, in my bedroom. Well. You're right. Um, I actually looked into this. <laughs> it is really almost impossible for the average citizen to buy an X-ray machine and set it up in their house. But there is an the next best thing. They're like, you're like, well, what, John? You know, am I supposed to go to the, my local doctor and ask to borrow his? Not really. I mean, uh, having tried that, it, there's a lot of questions they ask, especially when you're bringing in a you know a, a box of plastic and you're like, hey, I want to go X-ray this. No. But what you can do and, and where you can look at is uh, any of you, you people who know veterinarians or, or veterinary students, um, I have found that they're more than happy to rent out their equipment for doing this. And you, you might ask, well, why would I need it? There are situations in which you don't know the device you're working on or you don't know what's, you know, the guts of it or even the, the PCB you're working with. You don't know how many layers it has. So, you know, the, the physical boards that, that these things are made up of have multitude of layers and there could be components that are below, you know, the level that you can see. They could be embedded into it. So having access to a, a machine that can take an x-ray of it is almost like taking an x-ray of your body. You can see the makeup of the device that you're looking at. And, you know, veterinaries, uh, they, veterinarians have always, for me, been really uh, nice people to work with. <laughs> uh, they will help you out when you can. Obviously, you have to trade something of value, either money or, or your time. But they, they will generally help you out because for them, as long as you cover the cost of the materials and the time it takes to do it, it's nothing but you know what they do all day. I wouldn't suggest doing it yourself as there's a lot of science and, and knowledge that has to come in working safely around those products. But they can be a big help for you if you're just starting out on this and you need access to something that would take a lab, you know, thousands of dollars and weeks of your time. Uh, good lawyer is always good to have on retainer, uh, if you're, especially if you're going after products that have big names behind them and you don't want to heed my second or my third rule, be responsible. All right, Louis, uh, we're going to go to the next one. Got it. Thank you. So uh, as we look at Ceiling Cat, uh, Ceiling Cat is my mascot. Uh, how, do, how do we select our targets? Uh, I always want to start small. You know, we want low voltage, relatively simple device. Let's get our feet wet with this. Let, let's 
try to expand as we go. And as we build up that confidence, as, as we know what we're doing, we start moving into big stuff. So then we, we, we do some research. Uh, the FCC is, is probably your best friend in the research area. There's a lot of consumer devices out there that in, in quote unquote IoT things that uh, have to go through FCC certification. They, they have to document everything that goes into it, even take pictures, which will really help you. And they make this all searchable for you with pictures and pictures are always great. Uh, it, it helps you when you are looking for what the next target is and, and you've found a device and say, hey, I really like that. I, I own one or two and I really want to you know, get into it. How do I get to that next step? Well, yeah, start with our own government because they probably had to file something at some point and all the information you need is there. And then from there, you move on to you know, the device manufacturer, the firmware. You know, the, go through their support site. Look at what you have to download. What does it interface with? All right, next one, Louis. Yep. So when I'm starting my target selection, where where should you look? Well, uh, I always like looking at toys first. Um, they they're usually pretty cheap and they're of safe build quality. Uh, obviously, we, in the U.S., we we have laws against uh, harming children with toys. So that's why they took lawn darts off the market. So uh, you'll be pretty safe to say that working on them, you know, is, is not going to cause any real bad stuff to happen. Uh, I was once at a conference in, uh, I believe I was in Toronto at the time, and I heard this talk by this amazing, you know, individual who took a children's toy. It was a two-way communicator, uh, like text messaging before that was a thing, and he turned it into a device to... Uh, open up all the garage doors in his neighborhood. Uh, the kid happened to be 11 at the time. Um, and no help from his parents. This is just something he went in. So obviously, I mean, toys are, are a huge uh, way of entering this area. And it's fun. Um, you know, how, going through this whole process on stuff like that it can be a, less intimidating when it's something like, you know, a speaking spell. Um, from there, you know, what else? Uh, personal devices, IoT, quote unquote things. Um, those are, again, a good area to start because there's so many of them out there. And what you'll find is that there's a relatively small number of companies who actually make the guts of it. Uh, they're, they're called ODMs or original device manufacturers. They're the ones who actually make the guts and then they sell those guts to the OEMs, which are the original equipment manufacturers, who put the nice plastic casing around them and, and maybe make some tweaks to the firmware. but but what you'll find is some of that software, the flaws exist, you know, way down the original development of it. So you may have found a, a bug in, in one of the company's, you know, implementations of it, but that bug could be, you know, across multiple different companies. So, you know, personal devices or, or the IoT quote unquote things are another good area to, to start on because the, there's a lot of, you know, supply and, and a lot of things that you can get your, your teeth in really quickly. What do we not want to start with? Uh, don't start with refrigerators. Don't start with ATMs or, or, or cars. Uh, a lot of people get into this like, oh, I want to start car hacking right now. Take your time, build it up, build build up your resources, build up your toolbox, and, and build up your own confidence to, to take on some of that. Because I mean, uh, if you if you heed my my warnings about you know always buy two, well, not many people can buy two Teslas, right? Uh, you have to get to a point where uh, you can feel confident enough to know that you're not going to set it on fire or, or brick it. So always stick to, to low voltage, battery powered things, uh, stuff that that you know you can safely work with and, and build that confidence. Uh, we hit your next one, Louis. Yep. All right. So as I spoke about earlier, you know the FCC is and the FCC.id.io website are are huge. Um, this is a searchable database of, of all things registered with the FCC. Uh, and, and you're like, well, John, what does that have to do with embedded devices? Well, if a device is communicating wirelessly uh, or emitting any sort of radio interference, uh, it has to register itself with the FCC uh, under Part 15, where you know we, we have to make sure we're not interfering with other stuff. And so in doing so, the FCC requires you to go through a whole bunch of testing and in that testing, you have to submit a whole bunch of documentation along with pictures, but also a bill of materials of what it's made up in. All stuff that as a researcher is great for you because it's all, it's all searchable 
and you download it and you now have a roadmap of what it is you're working on. You know, what it is that, that makes up this device that, that you just now got your hands on. So where do you go from there? Uh, as I spoke about earlier, the ODM or and OEM uh, relationship. So these are the companies that make the, I would say, guts for the, the better word. The ODMs make the, 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 the physical board. So if you buy a, uh, a D-Link router, right, they may have been the ones that actually made the router board, but they sold that same board to D-Link and to Netgear. Um, and at that point, Netgear and D-Link becomes the, the OEM or the original equipment manufacturer. They put the plastic casing around it. They may have added some stuff to uh, to the uh, firmware. They they may ha have you know added their branding to the outside of it. But the hardware is still the same, or it may just be a variation of it. It, it may have been you know one uh, OEM wanted a certain chipset, whereas the other OEM didn't. Right, so. These websites are often a great treasure trove of information about what's inside, you know, this device you're looking at. If the FCC tells you that, you know, the CPU is made from Broadcom, you know, you can kind of go look through the ODMs or OEMs, or, or even look at SparkFun and those. Let's see, see what's available. See what kind of evaluation boards are available. Maybe you can get one that's like it. Um, it it's just this is all part of your research to kind of build up that roadmap of how you're going to attack it. Same with data sheets. Uh, every CPU manufacturer, every component manufacturer produces data sheets, and they are just that. They're very dense. They have a lot of information in them, but again, they, they help you plan out and start drawing out your attack. All right, Louie, let's hit the next one. Yep. So software. Um, you know, like, that's great, John. You've talked a lot about hardware, but I'm really about, you know, hacking software. W where do I start here? Well, you're you're in luck. Uh, most embedded systems, you know, I, I use bunny quotes to say most. Um, I'd say about a good 80% of them are running a flavor of Linux or some other RTOS. Uh, RTOS stands for real-time operating system. So these are operating systems like VX Works that that do very specific things at a very, very specific time. Um, they they operate a lot differently than say your normal desktop OSs. Um, so, and how do you know the difference, right? I mean, that's the next question. Generally, uh, you'll find RTOSs in, in, in devices that have to operate um, on a predictable series. So, you know, you, you a coffee maker, for instance, you know, where you, if you set a timer that there can be no preempting that task. If I want my smart coffee maker to, to drip my coffee at 7 a.m., it, it has to happen at that moment. Generally, that's where you'll find RTOS or in medical equipment, um, stuff of that nature. You'll find Linux in, in your more uh, consumer-pointed devices, your, your Wemos, your uh, smart home control. Uh, a lot of your, your kids' uh, uh, toys will, will have some flavor of, of Linux or some scaled-down version. Uh, you, you won't find Windows too much uh, outside of that a ATM that uh, Wasabi just showed us. Um, there's, there wasn't a lot of market for the embedded Windows, it's going all the way back to Windows CE, and it's been very hard for developers to embrace uh, the, the APIs and, and to get Windows running on these architectures. So my advice is brush up on your knowledge uh, of Linux and, and RTOS. And, you know, if a device can be controlled via an app, say it's, you know, your, your smart ceiling fan uh, that's wirelessly controlled through Bluetooth, you know, if it can be controlled via an app, download the app, start reversing the app, see how it's communicating with the device. Um, that's usually a good indication of how you can take, uh, you know, that device and, and start looking at what security flaws it has. Uh, years and years ago, I was working with a, a company creating a, um, a smart switch. It basically was a a plug, or sorry, <laughs> it was an appliance control device. That uh, what we found is that through the app on the phone, we kind of reverse engineered the protocol that it used to talk to the the other side, and we we found ways that we could turn on the device and turn it off, and and, and cause a uh, a malfunction to happen. That that would have been quite deadly if it had happened in, in the wild. And this is just an example of looking at, at very basics. I didn't know how the device was set up or created. I just looked at how the application was talking to it and thinking, well, okay, taking out the context of the phone, 
if I just sent these commands to it, what does it do, right? Um, and, and this is where you start thinking and you start going through, okay, you know, what are some scenarios in, in which we can expand the, the scope of, of usage of this device and can we make it do stuff it's not intended to do? All right, Lou, let's hit the next one. Yep. Firmware, all right. <laughs> This is the fun one, because this is where you get into playing with stuff, even if you don't have it. So, I mean, say you, you went out there and you, you start thinking to yourself, you know, I, I'd, I'd really like to test on this device. I, I don't have one. I probably couldn't afford one or two if I needed to. How can I still test it? Well, fortunately, looking at the firmware or the software that runs the device can tell you a lot about it and can get you, depending on how it's set up, can get you most of the way there. And like, well, John, if that's the case, why isn't everyone just making their own stuff? Well, it, it's not so simple. Um, so a couple tools in, in the firmware game, uh, Binwalk from Refirm Labs, uh, they now have a, a web service where you can take a, a piece of firmware that you get, upload it to their service, and they will do the fun bits of extracting it for you and kind of laying out the individual files. Um, Binwalk used to be a, a small program that uh, you'd have to run individually in your machine to kind of extract out. They've made it so much simpler now with a web-based interface. You literally upload, click a button, wait a few minutes, and then they present you with everything they found. Like, well, that's great, John, but how do I get the firmware in the first place? Well, that's where Google and the company website come in. All those support updates uh, or support sites, all, all the, um, you know, the updates you get, saying, hey, there's a new version available. Well, go check the website, find it, save it, and then start your, your adventure walking through Binwalk, pulling out those individual files that make up the firmware and start trying to understand what architecture you're looking at. What, what, what do these things mean? You know, how, how am I gonna use this to build up you know, my testing environment? And that comes to the next one, VMs. Uh, virtual machines are huge in, in testing stuff if even if you do have the hardware it, it's a way that you can prove out what's going on within you know your your test scenario or your security research without actually damaging the device or having the device even near you Lou, you want to hit the next slide got it so what's our quick hit list uh, you know what what stuff should you be looking at as you're diving into this uh, I always start with the CPU and architecture. Uh, most things today are gonna be ARM-based. Uh, MIPS used to be the, the big go-to, but it, it's fallen out of favor. Uh, but we also wanna know how much RAM does it have? What kind of storage? Is it NAND? Can I, you know, can I identify the storage chips on, on the board? Can I pull them off and read them? Um, is it flash storage? Is, is there a battery that's keeping a real-time clock going? Uh, these are things you, you want to write down, you want to explore as you're going through and kind of building out your model so that you can understand what you're looking at. Uh, communications, is there a JTAG port? So uh, kind of rule of thumb on, on evaluating PCB boards, if you see four uh, solder pads grouped closely together, nine out of ten times it's a JTAG port. Th those four lines are your send and receive, uh, your, your plus five volts and a ground. Um, sometimes you only see two. But if you see four closer together, 90% of the time there, there is a serial port under there, you gotta go attack it. Um, but did they, you know, is there wireless? Is there Bluetooth low energy? Did they buy a, a chipset capable of wireless and Bluetooth, but only turn one of them on? So how can you get the other to turn on and do something with it? Um, you know, did they leave any SPI interfaces open? SPI is called the small peripheral interface. It is a way that you can communicate with the microcontroller uh, directly uh, and it's bi-directional. And if there is an open interface, you can basically instruct the, the device to do what you want it to do. Uh, third one there is, is boot up. Can we see it boot? Do, does it use secure boot? What kind of bootloader does it use? Can, you know, where's it getting its initial code, can we inject our own code in there? Can we tell it to boot what we want it to boot? Um, this was the early days of, you know, the PS1 hacking, and that was what we did. We, we told it to boot what we wanted it to boot, not its own operating system. We, we bypassed, you know, it, its initial boot instructions and said, hey, we, we've got a valid operating system for you, just boot ours. Looking at the software, this is where the, the firmware extraction comes in. 
you know, what's driving it? What was it written in? Was it written in C? Was it written in Python, PHP? What was it, you know, in RTOS was was it used? From from here you can kind of again narrow down your attack vectors and go, okay, if it's using an outdated version of Python, you know, is it using modules that have an open exploit? Is there a way I can get in there? Uh, accounts, you wouldn't believe how many uh, consumer devices leave uh, backdoor accounts in there um, and that are, are easily, you know, identified by looking through the firmware, you know. Uh, are, are there services running as root uh, that, that can be exploited? Uh, I also left up here, and, and I'll put this in the Discord, um, <clears throat> a really good friendly guide uh, that Adam Tasha wrote up on, on how to go about this and, and kind of where some of the, these these quick hits come from. All right, Louis, next. Yep. So they kind of blew through that. Uh, where to go? Um, keep going up. You know, as you get your feet beneath you and as you start moving through uh, this this journey, you know, you, you want to keep on scaling up and what you're doing and getting that confidence level and, and attacking bigger and better things. And you can do that through bug bounties, which is where I got a lot of the hardware that I've worked on in my life. Um, because there's a number of companies that are looking for people with this skill set, are looking for people just to take the chance. And you know, at the end of the day, you also you know get a whole bunch of free gear. I mean, who doesn't like that? But really, it comes down to we have a lack of you know skilled resources that are even want to attempt doing this. Uh, as you guys saw at the beginning of this presentation, there is a lot that that goes into just getting your your toolkit up, and then there's a plethora of information out there. It's almost overload, right? And so I'd say keep on moving, keep getting bigger and bigger. And in the end, this look, if it feels like something you could do a lot, if it feels like something that you could turn into, you know, every day you just love this, then there is jobs for you, whether it's on the product security engineering side, whether it's on the product security incident response team side, that there is a path for you that is in demand right now and that people really need. All right, so that, Louis, I believe, uh, hit the next one. Got it. All right, so now we come to the, the, the Q&A part of it, and I am right on time, even with all that. So I am open to the Discord. I'm also looking through the uh, chat, and I will pull up the Q&A. I got nothing in here. Just, did everybody leave? <laughs> <laughs> Have I been talking to myself for the last half hour? I think they're blown away. Or or they all just left and I suck. No. <clears throat> well, if anyone does have any questions and, and, and oh wait, I got something we, here. Yeah, we got a Q and A here. Oh, the question was from uh, Air 418, uh, where do you find hardware-based bug bounties? That is an excellent question. So, uh, Synac actually has a whole hardware track. So, as you register with Synac, you tell them that you're interested in, in hardware, and they will specifically put you into a, a track focused on hardware. Uh, bug Crown and Hacker 1 kind of uh, do it more project by project, you have to really look into it. And as you matriculate up through their programs, uh, you get uh, availed for more of these special hardware uh, type uh, assessments. But, uh, or, you know, if, uh, if you're willing to spend your own money, um, I know Mattel does run their own, uh, only because I've worked with them on setting it up. Uh, so, you know, I'll go check and see. Uh, I believe Belkin had one at a time too. Um, you know, if you find a device you really like, you know, buy three or four and, and then go check and see if they have the bug bounty. But I know for, for a fact, uh, uh, Synac and, and, uh, Hacker, or and Bug Crowd both do theirs. So, like I said, Synac actually has a specialized track for it that you can specialize in, and that's all you'll ever get. All right. Louis, you were going to say something? Uh, no. Uh, oh, okay. Just, just mentioning your, your Q&A. 
So no questions in uh, Discord here? I'm looking at Discord right now, nothing there. How sad. <laughs> uh, John, so this, this presentation was really jam-packed. Um, is it possible that we could post this on our website, your slides? Yeah. yeah. Now that I, I have it now. <laughs> now that I have it. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff in there. And, and I think it'll be a, a good help to anybody who wants to go review this later. Yeah, really, really cool stuff. You can just edit out the whole like 10 minutes of me not being able to use PowerPoint. I think I push pause. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if anyone, nobody had any questions. Well, thank you so much, John. That was really cool stuff. Oh, no problem, Louie. Thank you, guys. Appreciate being here.